Good day, everyone. Welcome to one of our bite-sized videos of which the purpose is to bring you, the integrator, up to speed with some of the basic concepts surrounding the Flowgear integration experience, as well as take a brief dive into one of our popular use cases. We're going to start by exploring the screen in front of you, the Flowgear console, which is the very first thing you'll be greeted with after logging into Flowgear. The Flowgear console provides access to all the components relevant to your integrations. From here, you can navigate to spaces that facilitate the setup for different parts of the integration. The three primary spaces that I'd like to briefly touch on are the workflows, connections, and drop points. Workflows can be found by navigating to the workflow section over here. And workflows provide a canvas from which you can drag and drop connectors and tooling provided by the Flowgear platform and construct your integration according to your business rules. We will go more in depth around workflows once we start to explore the specific use case. Connections, which we can navigate to by clicking over here, are spaces with which you can provide credentials that allow you to authenticate and connect to the systems which you would like to integrate with. We can go ahead and click on the new button over here, and we can go ahead and select a particular connector to work with. And connect, choosing any one of the connectors we can see here within the connector section, such as ConnectWise Manage, you'll see there's a space in which you can plug in credentials that are relevant to that specific platform. You then have the option of providing credentials for different profiles, such as test and production, and you will be able to run your workflow or integration within that profile, which will then target that specific environment that you've set up. If you set up your credentials correctly, you can click on the play button over here, which if successful, will give you a green banner telling you that the test succeeded. Finally, we have the drop point section. The idea behind the drop points is that it is our solution to hybrid on-prem and cloud integrations. You can install the drop point agent onto your on-prem servers, which will allow us then to talk to those servers within the scope of what you allow us to do using the whitelisting features. This means that we can talk to your file systems, we can talk to your AD, or we can move data between CRMs and ERPs that are not exposed to the internet with the drop point. These three spaces are the most important aspects related to the integrations themselves within Flowgear. For a deeper dive into the elements that make up the Flowgear console, please see our bite-sized video focusing on navigating the Flowgear console. Next, we're going to take a deeper dive into workflows and nodes. To do this, we're going to navigate to the workflow section, which we have done by clicking on this workflow over here. And from there, we're going to open up a new workflow by clicking on the new button right over here, at which point we're given the option to name the workflow, which we can name it appropriately, and click on the OK button over here, at which point you are then greeted with the Flowgear Design Canvas, the purpose of which is to provide you with the space to drag and drop Flowgear tooling in a specific sequence and order to string it together and then form the basis of an integration from end to end. Now to start dropping the tooling onto the canvas, we're going to click this plus icon over here, which is going to open up a list of our nodes. All of these little blocks are what we consider nodes. And simply put, a node is a function or set of functions that have been encapsulated in a certain way that the most complex aspects of it have been obscured from you and only the parts that you have to interact with are exposed. Now within our nodes, we have distinct categories. And the first category you can see here are the connectors. The connectors are responsible for talking to the systems with which you would like to integrate. And so all of the complexity around authenticating and talking to these platforms is hidden behind the node. And again, only the most relevant aspects of the node are exposed to you. Triggers are nodes that allow you to determine how a workflow should kick off. So it gives you architectural freedom around when a workflow should run and how it should run. In other words, if you would like a workflow to run twice daily or every 15 minutes, or perhaps on receiving a particular email, triggers will facilitate that process. Processes are the nodes that are responsible for actually supplementing, transforming, and enriching the data sets that you need to work with. So when you receive data from system A and needs to be transformed to a different structure so that system B can ingest it, the processes are there to facilitate that functionality as well as implement further business rules that you may have necessary for your integration. And then finally, evaluators are the nodes that are going to have a look at the result of a transaction and allow you to kick off additional supporting logic within that workflow. In other words, should a transaction fail, does somebody need to be emailed? Does someone have to be informed in some way? Does a report have to be built? So, so on and so forth. These four categories encapsulate all the tools that Flowgear provides the integrator, allowing you to build both simple and complex integrations within the scope of a simplified experience.
For this demo, we're going to be looking at the movement of customer data from Sage Intact into the Salesforce environment. By the end of the demo, you should have a basic understanding of how to use these two branded connectors as well as, well as how to set up an extract, transform, and load style integration within the Flowgear environment. To kick this process off, the first thing we're going to want to do is open up a new workflow. And so again, here on the workflow page, we have the option to click on the new button over here, which is going to give us the option to open up a new workflow, in which case we can call customer sync and say, okay. Now that we have a fresh canvas to work with, we're going to start dropping the functionality and connectors we need to complete this particular integration. And again, within the scope of what we're looking to achieve here is to move customers and customer data from the Sage Intact environment into Salesforce. Now to start this process, again, we want to start getting the appropriate connectors onto the canvas. To do this, we're going to click on the plus icon over here, navigate to our connector section, and we can start to look for the particular connectors we would like to work with. In this case, we will look for the Sage Intact branded connector and do the similar thing with the Salesforce branded connector. And in between this whole process, we're going to have to transform this data from structure A to structure B and supplement it in whatever way necessary to have Salesforce accept that data. And so for this task, we're going to use a processor called the quick map. Now that we have these three nodes hooked up to the canvas, we can see that there's a basic flow starting to form where we're going to get information from Sage Intact, use the quick map to transform it, and then pass it into Salesforce with a, with a Salesforce connector. Now, the first step after we've visualized what we're looking to do is to actually stand up the connections into these environments. And so what we'll do is we'll click on the drop down over here and I'll select the pre setup connection that I uh, set up early on. Now, if we go ahead and open up this connection as if you were setting it up for the first time, you'll see that there again are two profiles we, we can work with test and production. And within the test profile, I've set up the credentials for our Sage sandbox environment. And again, a connector is a space in which you can plug in credentials relevant to that platform, which you would like to authenticate. If I click on the play icon over here, it will go ahead and test that connection for me. And I'm greeted with a green banner to say that I've successfully set up that connection. Now that I'm confident that the connection is working, I can go ahead and head back to the canvas to carry on with the rest of the work. Once you've set up your connection within the branded connect experience, you'll be able to click on the options over here or context window and say, choose sample. What that does is generate a list of potential actions that you can perform against that platform's API or that services API. In which case here, we want to list customers. Now, once you've done this, what's happening in the background is the connector is obscuring all of the complex, complex aspects of the integration, such as what endpoint to hit and how to hit it. And all it's doing for you is giving you some basic information to work with here on the canvas, such as how is that request going to happen? In this case, we can have a look at this request and we can see that it's going to return all the fields and a page size of 100, meaning 100 results. We're going to go ahead and change this to one for the sake of the um, demo and close this up over here. And now within the scope of Sage Intact, we can actually run that integration in isolation by clicking on the context window again and saying run this node. Now you see we had an error here saying there was no URL. And the reason this occurred is because we've ran this integration in the production profile, which is incorrect because we've set up credentials for tests. So we're going to go ahead and swap this over. And if you want to permanently keep it in test, you can go ahead and change it in the settings over here and then saving that. And now we're going to go ahead and try this one more time. Run this node. And this time there is no failure. And as you can see at the bottom here, which is what we call the workflow activity logs, you can see the result of the transaction for that particular node, the Sage Intact node. And we can see that on that response, we have one customer record that came through and it's reasonable security. And so we can go ahead and close this. Now that we know that we have data for the Sage Intact side of things, and we in fact have a working connection. So I'm just gonna go back one more time on the response and I'm gonna click on this little icon over here, which is going to set that value on the node and it's gonna give us some sample data to work with. So we're quite happy with the Sage Intact portion of this. Next is to work with Salesforce. And now under a similar experience, we're gonna go ahead and pick the environment we've set up previously. We could open up that connection and just show you what that looks like. And again, we'll see on the test profile, we have all of the relevant credentials plugged in and we can go ahead and test that. We greet it with a green banner so we know that's working and we can head back to the customer workflow. And again, we can open up the context menu and choose a particular sample that we would like to work with. 
In this case, we're going to go ahead and create an account. Click on that create account. And just like Sage Intact, all of the complex aspects of this particular process are being obscured from us. And we are simply greeted with a request payload sample that we can then work with, which is showing us what fields are relevant to that object and what type of data they are and so on and so forth. Now that we have both sample data for Sage Intact and Salesforce, we can begin to hook up these payloads to the quick map by taking the response to the source and then linking up the result to the request within Salesforce. And once that's done, we can go ahead and say change view. And that's going to give us a visual representation of those data structures on the left and on the right hand side. The left hand side is the data coming in from Sage Intact and the right hand side is the structure that Salesforce is expecting us to represent. Now, what we can do is just hook up a couple of these fields over here so we can start to see what happens. We're going to take name, for instance, and plug it into name. And then I'm going to look for a bill to address over here. We can search that filter and we can see a couple of these fields that we can actually start to pass along, such as street address, the city, and so on and so forth. And now we can see on the right hand side, we have a sample or preview of that payload starting to form. And we can see the data is from the Sage Intact side, but it's actually structured as what Salesforce would expect us. So now that we have some basic information mapped from point to point, we can explore some of the other functions that QuickMap provides, which are to further enrich and supplement the data. So beyond the simple mapping of structure from A to B, we have the ability to add more business rules and workflow rules within the scope of this tool to facilitate some more complex requirements you may have on the uh, other side of your, your integration, such as what happens if you have a billing street, which has a maximum of 10 characters. In the case of the quick map, you can use a function called left, select your field and select the number of characters of 10 that you would like to trim it to and close that off. Now, anything that's more than 10 characters will be trimmed and you can see it trimmed it there with, with the Y being taken away. So what we've tried to do here is mimic many of our functions around Excel. The idea is that Excel is a platform that many people are familiar with, and it's not necessarily a development or a hardcore technical experience. And so within the scope of the quick map, we've provided functions such as left, VLOOKUP, SUM, and COUNT, all of which can help you supplement and enrich the data further to qualify what you need to have that final payload to pass it along. So again, besides the simple mapping of structure from A to B, the quick map tool gives you the simple tooling you need to go and enrich that data even further. Now that we're quite happy with the structure of the payload over here, we're going to go ahead and close this off. And we can start to hook up the integration from point to point. We have set up a successful Sage connection and tested that. We have got the payload that we expect to pass through. All that's left is to run this integration from point to point. But before we do that, let's head off to the Salesforce app itself and we can see over here within the list of all of our accounts we do not have that account that we saw previously which was reasonable security so we can see there there's no reasonable security account and so we're going to head back to the canvas i'm going to run this entire workflow from point to point and again we can see the workflow workflow activity log pop up at the bottom here and we can see node for node exactly what happened and so the first thing was the sage and tech node returning the data from its environment which we can see over here second the quick map transformed the data into the structure that we expect to see it which is this over here and then finally salesforce received that data and came back with a response to say the success flag is true here's a unique id for that field that we've just created or that object sorry and here is some of the data returned to us. And if we go back to the Salesforce side of things over here and do a refresh, we can now see the reasonable security account sitting within the environment. So this simple process really encapsulates what it is like to build a, an extract, transform, and load integration from point to point. This particular process is not production ready. And so you will need to add aspects like error handling and any additional workflow logic that you would like to include in your workflow. But all of that is provided to you through the tooling within the Flowgear environment here with our connectors and our processes and our triggers. So any additional logic you need to include with this integration can be done through those tools.
Now that we've shown you how to build a workflow, if at any point you have to go back and see what happened in that workflow, you can navigate to the workflow logs over here. For more detailed information on the topics we explore today, or if you would like to explore more complex aspects of the platform, including architecture and best practices, please join us for our technical certification course hosted on udb.com. Also, go ahead and check out some of our other bite-sized videos for more common use cases and platform features. Also, please go ahead and visit our website where you can register for a free trial and complimentary proof of concept. Have a look at our unique pricing model or explore our list of over 200 pre-built connectors. Thank you very much for joining me for this short demo. Have a lovely day further.